So our next presenter is Michael Episcope with Origin Investments. And I'm bringing Michael up on the stage right now. And Origin Investments has been a longtime partner of Opportunity DB and has presented, uh, I think, at just about every OZ pitch day. This is our seventh one. So uh, always pleased to hear from Michael Episcope and what he has to say. With uh, We're presenting Origin Investments QOZ Fund 2 this afternoon. Is that right, Michael? That's correct, Jimmy. It's great to be here. Uh, great to see you, Michael. Uh, well, um, you've got 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Um, again, this presentation, it's just kind of a teaser. It should take less than the full uh, 20 minutes that Jimmy has allotted me here, and, and we'll have some time for some quick Q&A at the end. So a little bit about Origin. Uh, we help investors, high net worth investors, grow their wealth by building, buying, and lending to Class A multifamily properties in growth markets. We've been around uh, since 2015. I'm both a co-founder and a co-CEO of the company. And when we got into QOZ back in 2019, it really wasn't a large leap for us um, to create uh, QOZ1. We're talking about QOZ2 today. Every one of our investment partners, including um, my partner, David, and me, were taxable investors. And we were already in development at that time. So we have um, we just saw it as kind of a natural extension. Why not do um, more real estate, but e get even better tax breaks along the way? As a company, we've never lost uh, money on a fund deal. We've averaged a little more than a 2x gross multiple and a 22.5% uh, gross IRR over the last 10 years. That's really our, our fund deals. And one thing that we're really proud to say is that no one has invested more in Origins funds and deals than we have, my partner and I. We've invested $75 million of personal capital alongside investors since our founding. And today, proud to say we serve more than 3,200 individual investors and about 20% of our investor base, their clients of our roughly about 60 RAA partners out there. Uh, I'm going to jump into our strategy really quickly. Uh, we develop Class A multifamily properties in Sunbelt markets. Um, that's what this fund does. We were here before COVID too. Um, our thesis has always been lifestyle markets in low tax states. We have five offices throughout the country, one of which is in Chicago. Um, that's where I sit right now. We actually don't invest in Chicago. And our other offices, they really serve as sort of a regional presence to give us that boots on the ground. We have officers who live in their markets. Um, and that really leads to um, a lot of deal flow. And I, I would characterize our deal flow as prolific. Um, and I would say that we have one of the best pipelines of opportunities in QOZ of any manager in the multifamily state across the country. This fund is expected to generate um, between kind of a two and a quarter to two and a half net multiple over the first 10 years. And we do still believe that that's more than achievable in today's market and sort of some of the, um, the storm clouds that we see coming on the horizons and maybe even some negative rent growth um, next year, but a lot of positive rent growth over the next kind of four or five, even 10 years in these markets. Uh, the next slide, this, this fund, um, it caps out at $300 million and we've raised a little more than $200 million to date so far. And you can see our current pipeline there in sort of the middle slide. It's um, We have seed deals and pipeline deals that require around $290 million in total fund equity. And anyone investing in this fund today would be investing in the portfolio you see in front of you. And there are two areas I want to want you to focus on in this chart. And the first is the stabilized yield column. And that's also re referred to as return on cost. And this is the future cap rate we are building to. And the return on cost of this portfolio ranges anywhere from 5.3%, uh, the deal in Nashville at the top, all the way to 6%, with an average right around that 5.6%. So even with cap rates rising, I mean, you can kind of pick your number. There hasn't been a lot of price discovery transactions in the market. We're pricing assets today at 4.5%, even in these markets, that's up significantly from last year where they were three and a half percent. But you can see there's still a healthy margin in every one of these deals. And one of the biggest reasons these margins exist in our portfolio is that we've locked in a lot of the pricing while rents in these markets have continued to soar. The right-hand column is equally as important. These are rent growth forecasts over the next five years in this portfolio. 
and were produced by Origin Multilytics. And that's our proprietary machine learning tool built by two University of Chicago data science we hired about three years ago. There's a long story um, behind that. I don't have enough time to get into it today. But what I will say is it is the most sophisticated tool in the market. We have a lot of people um, knocking on our door about this, wanting to use it um, in one way or another. And remarkably, it's more accurate than any other um, forecasting tools out there that you can rent. Uh, that column, what's important is that it shows positive rent growth over five years in every one of our markets. And there are plenty of markets out there when we run these simulations that you actually get negative rent growth. And we just aren't in them in this, uh, in this particular fund. And we won't be in them because we use this tool to help us with strategy and it helps augment what the team sees on the ground as well. And it's important because 70% of our hold period, if you're going to be in for 10 years, if you're going to be in for 20, it's even more than that. But the majority of the hold period is going to be in a stabilized asset. And growth is the single most important variable when determining long-term investment returns. So we have to get the development right and build margins. But then once we're holding it after that, a lot of it has to do with beta and being in the right markets and picking the right submarkets to them. And we spend an inordinate amount of time getting the market right. And I'm person, I'm bullish on every one of these cities over the next 10 years. And Multilytics is saying the same thing. This slide shows, um, it's a snapshot kind of, of some of the properties we build. These are actual renderings of properties in our portfolio. So we tend to build garden, wrap, podium. These are different styles of building. Um, some are much less expensive than others, require more land. Um, what we don't do is we generally stay away from high rise, that more risk. Those are urban, taller buildings, things of that nature. And our renter is a renter by choice. So you can think of somebody who's making between $70,000 and $150,000, someone who could buy but chooses to rent. These are your white collar workers. They tend to have more discretionary income. And the thing that we look for in the demographic more than anything is affordability. When we're building these things and we're doing our analysis. And so our going in affordability ratio, which is defined by rent to gross income, it's got to be less than 25%. And we want to make sure that people can afford not only the initial rent, but also rent increases. And when you get into the upper, you know, sort of those low 30% range, the upper 20s, there's, a, there's no room to raise rents because people are maxed out. They just don't have any more discretionary dollars. And so it's, it's really important um, that you look at that affordability ratio. And when you're, when you're dealing with um, a white collar worker, their incomes also tend to go up a lot faster than those than blue collar um, workers as well. So somebody who's making $125,000 today is more likely to make $200,000 in a few years than somebody making $40,000 is likely to make $80,000. So those are kind of, kind of some of the things um, we look for when looking at pro projects and some of the things we consider. Lofts at Eastland is a deal I'll talk about briefly, and then we can open it up for some Q&A after this. I hope, Jimmy, hope we have some time. Um, we're excited about this deal. It's located in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is part of an 80-acre Eastland Mall development redevelopment site. And this is a failed mall. So we've all seen the class C malls that the anchors have left. It's just a parking lot. And what's happening with um, a lot of these malls is they're great locations in the cities are pouring money in them to redevelop them and bring them back to life um, in one way or the other. Certainly not as a mall again, but repurposing them. And in this case, the city is, is throwing their weight behind the successful redevelopment of the site. We are acquiring the land from them um, for around $2,500 per unit. That's insanely cheap. Um, and we're actually getting tax incentives on top of that worth about seven to $8 million. And those are valued right around $30,000 per unit. So. In this case, our land basis is actually less than zero. And the redevelopment, it's going to be beautiful when it's done. I've seen these renderings, I've seen the plans. Um, it's gonna have loads of park space and green space and a retail center. And you can sort of see it in those renderings in front of you now, what the end result. And some people, they might consider this a bit pioneering in the sense that we are one of the first developers getting out of the ground. But the beauty 
about QB, QZ is that we can take a long-term look. This isn't a buy, fix, sell where we're trying to get in two or three years. We can take a 10-year view here and watch as the redevelopment takes shape. It is an impressive master plan, and our property sits right in the center of it all. And this deal easily pencils out to around a 5.6% return on cost with conservative underwriting and a lot more future upside in the growth of this city. So I know that I, I did that pretty quickly, um, Jimmy. So hopefully we have uh, some questions that came in. And, and again, that was just the teaser. Oh, and I forgot to show, if you want to get in touch with us, that was my last slide. Um, bring bring up that last slide. That's the most important one. Well, I'll just say it. So email me, michael at origininvestments.com. Go to our website, origininvestments.com. Or you can email investorrelations at origininvestments.com. Any one of those places will get you to the right spot or at least start you off and, and we'll take care of you from there. Fantastic. I've just posted links to all of those um, uh, contacts in the chat, origininvestments.com, michael at origininvestments.com and investorrelations at origininvestments.com. Reach out uh, if you have any questions for Michael. We'll, we'll see if we can get to some live Q&A here. We've got another uh, 10 minutes to get to some Q&A. So First question is, Origin mentioned that you see negative rent growth for the next year, potentially. Does this change anything operationally for your funds? Uh, good, good question. So when we're running our Origin Multilytics, what we're looking at is negative rent growth, um, kind of end of 2023 going into 2024, and then a bounce back in 24 and 25. It definitely, like, I don't, the, the rent growth doesn't make as much of a difference as what we're looking at in borrowing costs and cap rates and interest rates in today's market, but certainly rent growth, when you're plugging it into a model and you have these other variables that have run away, if you're in a market um, that has negative rent growth over the next three, four or five years, the deal will not pencil out. So there's always gonna be ups and downs. You're always going to have um, you know, a, a little you know, dips along the way. And I'll tell people, and I've said this a lot, but this will not be the last recession we go through in this fund. So um, does it change our perspective? I think we've made a lot of good choices. The markets, the amount of leverage we use, the projects we build, um, the risk management we employ. We've done some interest rate hedging on swap option side as well. So we're always cautious and conservative, but you have to adjust to the existing market. And it would be naive for me to say that we haven't changed anything when interest rates in the last year have gone from you know one and a half percent to 4.3%. We've changed a lot. Um, Okay. No worries. So um, <laughs> Michelle mentions um, that there are 135 opportunity zones in Chicago where you're headquartered um, and many in the mayor's priority neighborhoods or community areas where city-led projects are being proposed. Why, why doesn't Origin Investments have any investments in Chicago? We, we have one investment here in Chicago in QOZ1. Um, but the advantage of our model is that we have a view of the entire United you know, Three, five, 10 years, Chicago doesn't make the cut. And, and for me and, and our investment dollars, I'd rather be in, in Nashville and Tampa and Jacksonville and Colorado Springs and markets like that. And, and that's the simple answer. And, and it, it is like we can be agile and move in and out of markets. And there's certainly markets that we were in, you know, five years ago that we're no longer in today and markets that we want to overweight for the next five years as well. <laughs> It all comes me. down to growth. Jimmy, you okay? You need to take it a does, break there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be all right. It's been a long day. Uh, got another question um, from Michelle. Um, do you have any socially conscious investments where ROI is less than desired, but exceeds the triple net gain? Do you ever, do you ever, do you ever put ROI aside and, and focus more on a positive impact, I guess, is kind of what her question is getting at. What's your philosophy there? So we're not a, we're not a so like a, a positive impact fund. That's not what we put. Like our job, because of the way this program was designed, is in order for investors to get the benefit, we have to make returns. So that's first and foremost. I would say the ancillary benefits of what we're doing, and I tell people this: the QZ program, in many ways, as people were looking at it, it, it had all these maybe unintended consequences, or it didn't help these neighborhoods. And I look back and I'm like, well, did you really think that just building a you know, brand new pretty building in a in a distressed neighborhood is going to make that neighborhood better. What it is, is a huge jobs program. So our first fund has about a billion dollars worth of assets. This fund will have more than a billion dollars worth of assets. 
And we've created a lot of jobs along the way, both at origin and on the ground during the construction pro construction in between. And we're going to deliver a lot of returns as well. But that's not the primary goal of our of our fund. And I know it is of others. So Amy has an interesting question. Uh, she asks, can you say why you want to be in the areas where you are? Maybe you can tell us about the cap rates there. What do you like about the areas where you're investing? Yeah, well, first I, I alluded to this. It starts with the market, but then I would characterize that when we're looking at QOZ areas, there's about 5% of them that are viable across the whole United States, right? We talk about 8,700 zones out there, but even in our cities, there, there's such a finite data set that you can hunt in. We look for deals that are along the fringes, that are literally right on the edge of the QOZ area and market rate. And when you go and you saw any one of our QOZ sites, like Nashville, I'll give you an example, the Edge Hill site down there, it sits right at the edge of the Gulf. And, and you're looking at this and you can't believe it's a QOZ until you really understand the law and you go back because everything was based on the 2010 census. And in 2010, nobody lived in downtown Nashville. It was empty. And all of that building and development has just exploded now. And there are still these, um, what I'll call diamonds in the rough. And, and that's what we're looking for because QOZ doesn't change our cost of capital. We don't use a different set of Excel requirements. Our job is to make you money. You can, um, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. So whether it's um, direct development for our growth fund or for our QZ fund, they both have the same cost of capital. Uh, next question here is, um, how many assets do you expect you'll have in that fund two portfolio? Um, and when, when, when do you think you might identify all of them? Um, we're going to, well, already the fund has $290 million in uh, pipeline and C deals. So what you saw on the screen is sort of the, you know, almost the full portfolio. Some of those could change out. Even in today's world, deals are getting delayed. Deals are getting uh, mothballed. New deals are coming in a little faster. So generally in a fund like this, we, we see the whole portfolio being about 12, um, 12 to 15 assets in total. Good. Um, so just since uh, our last pitch day event back in July, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but um, interest rates have gone up several times um, and by pretty big jumps over those last few months. What is your approach to debt now and how has those uh, those interest rate increases impacted it for your projects? So I, I'll give you, it was about I would say our first hedge that we put on interest rates, because you got to remember that um, development debt is floating rate and you can hedge those with swaps, but not every bank swaps um, develop, swaps interest rates. And so what we did is we went to the market and we bought swaptions, which are not a perfect hedge, but they're still directionally really good. And we hedged about, about half, 50 to 60% of the interest rates in this portfolio. That's actually a large asset of this portfolio, our our view on interest rates is, um, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you um, guidance. Um, they've gone up faster than anybody could have imagined. But this is one thing I love personally about ground up development is the margin. And we've been talking about this for more than two years in all of our funds that the way you protect basis is either through lending or through building. But you can't do it in buying. So value add buying above replacement cost was probably not a good bet in the last year, and that's going to come back down to earth. But development, you can still develop at prices that make sense, especially relative to where new properties are trading today. And I know that doesn't answer the question about debt, but in this portfolio, once we have a chance to fix debt, we will, but we will also have a percentage, call it 30 to 35% of the debt that's floating. Because if you do the analysis looking backwards, floating rate debt is, is, has almost always been cheaper than fixed rate debt. And so it's it's good from a risk management perspective to have the majority of your portfolio fixed, but still have some of it um, that's floating along the way. So these properties, once they're built, um, we'll get out of those swaptions, we'll enter into fixed rate debt, and we'll, we'll see about floating rate debt and where we are at that time. Certainly if interest rates go back down below 3%, we'll probably fix the entire portfolio. Good, so uh, I just had a question from Oliver that I'll answer. From the chat, uh, Oliver was asking, where are the links to the various presenters and their information? Um, we, we do have that available as a free download. If you head to opportunitydb.com slash bonuses, you'll be able to 
download our OZ investing cheat sheet. And we've got um, we've got info on all of our presenting funds here today. You could also head to ozpitchday.com to view the current agenda and list of speakers. Uh, several more great questions here. Um, move on to, um, actually, Amy wanted to follow up. She was asking specifically about cap rates in the areas where uh, Origin is investing. I, I think we forgot to answer her on that one. So what are, what are some cap rate ranges that you'd like to see? Uh, cap rates in today's market, I mean, they're up at least 100 basis points from the low. So everything that we're valuing and looking at, when, when I'm looking at this return on cost out there and I'm giving you um, the multiples, we're looking at a 4.5% cap rate in these markets. Um, we don't know. There hasn't been a lot of price discovery. Uh, there have been a few transactions, and many of those are momentum and things that were already in place. And we'll see what's going to happen over the next 12 months. And I think what we're really going to see from a price discovery is when you start getting negative rent growth and some of this last year's rent growth being given back and then loans um, coming due and refinancings um, maybe not taking place. So you used to be able to take 50% of your equity out and there's no doubt when we run the math, people are going to have to come to the table with a lot of equity in the refinancing scenarios here in the next year. Um, good, the good, good news is, though, is I, I'm sorry, as I'm looking out, you know, like 23, 24, probably a little rocky. At the end of 24, it jumps back and 25 <clears throat> looks um, to be pretty good vintage. Excellent. Uh, we've got time for one or two more questions. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, she's been prolific with the questions all throughout the course of the day today. Thank you for your participation, Michelle. Uh, what is the project that you are most proud of and why? Uh, you're proud. What is, I'll, I'll say what I'm most excited about. Um, I, I love, like the two markets I'm most excited about are Colorado Springs and Jacksonville. And those markets, we just did our entire retreat with our company, took all 50 people down to Colorado Springs. We've got four developments down there. We did market tours and you can just feel the energy and why people want to live down there. And then Jacksonville benefits from that lifestyle city, low tax state, growth, everything from it. So I, I'm really excited about those two cities. In terms of particular projects, um, you know, it, it, it just comes down to which projects are going to um, perform the best in the fund. That's what I get more excited about than, than an actual real estate project itself. Because, you know, our, our job, what we're doing here is to build wealth for other people. And, and that's what we want to do. And that's what I get excited about is when I come on these webinars, we've done our job and done it well. Absolutely. Uh, well, one last question from Jerry. Uh, and thank you for all your questions today, Jerry. Jerry's also been great today. Uh, does Origin joint venture with developers? Uh, we do. Yeah. Majority of our properties, we also de develop directly. But the majority of what we do, and, and that's, a, um, that's a function of our sort of national model, and oftentimes what we're doing is getting into deals um, that are shovel ready. And it really increases also our, um, our acquisition pipeline. So you can think about our partners as extensions of our organization. And, and we, have, um, we have four acquisition officers out there that's gonna be moving to six in a couple of years. But when you add our partners, we have 15 out there looking at deals. And that's what I said earlier about having the most prolific pipeline across the United States in multifamily. I truly believe that. All right. Well, um, we're out of time, Michael. And we, we got through almost all the questions. I think if, if we didn't get to your question, you can reach out to Michael directly, michael at origininvestments.com. I, I just put his uh, that, that info in the chat. I'll, I'll put it up there one more time because it's, it's kind of fallen off the, the front page now. Uh, but Michael, thank you so much for presenting with us today. Always great to have you on OZ Pitch Day. Jimmy, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.